Okay, uh, so we're very pleased and privileged to have um, in our audience today and uh, about to come up on stage, we've got Sanjeeva Wirawarana, who is the founder and CEO of WSO2. Um, so Sanjeeva, um, prior to starting WSO2 in 2005, Sanjeeva worked at IBM Research Labs uh, for about eight years, where he worked there on their, uh, the IBM middleware uh, products. Um, and Sanjeeva was a, a co-author of many of the web services standards that some of us at my vintage know and love and remember fondly. You know, things like WSDL. So WSDL, you may not remember, WSDL became Waddle, which became Swagger, which became Open API Spec, right? So there's a continuity here. We've got swings and roundabouts, and there's a history behind what we're all doing today. And Sanjeeva was right there, kind of at the beginning of this history. Um, so prior to joining IBM, Sanjeeva earned a PhD in computer science at Purdue University. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Sanjeeva to the stage, and we'll have a chat. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So, you founded WSO2 with uh, Paul, Paul Fremantle and uh, Davinam um, in 2005. What was the opportunity that you saw at that stage, um, and what was the vision? How has that vision evolved over the last 17 years? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and nice to be here. Yeah. So we started WSO2 in 2005. At that time, I was in IBM Research. Um, web services were sort of, this is a pre-API era. We were trying to find ways of making systems interconnect. And IBM was, uh, was working very closely with Microsoft and trying to define a set of standards to make the interoperability work. But the way that IBM was interested in building middleware around that at the time was very much uh, keep what we have and put another layer in front of it. So the, the idea of service orientation and uh, the, the, the word API wasn't really being used, but the interface-oriented programming concepts were being supported in a very second-class way in how systems were being built. Uh, I actually tried inside IBM Research to build an alternative platform for that to compete with the WebSphere platform at the time. I tried very hard inside IBM to make a product out of it. Uh, took it all the way through the IBM software group, um, trying to take it out to market, saying this is how we should build this stuff. And wasn't really, you know, it wasn't the right IBM, it wasn't the right business decision for IBM at the time. So they chose not to. They said, we're not going to do it. We'll just merge, you know, whatever bits of stuff here and there into various products. Uh, and then we discussed and decided, what the heck, you know, we'll start a company. None of us knew anything about starting a company. Uh, but it was like, okay, well, we have some ideas for technology. We were open source guys. So we figured out, give it a shot. Yep. Great. That's how we started. Yeah. And you, um, I mean, you were at the, the core of a lot of the Apache open source um, yeah. frameworks and platforms that we that we use and still use, you know, um, WS4J, uh, all of those kinds of systems really came out of those early days of WSO2, didn't they? Yeah, so we worked on, uh, I've been an open source contributor for way longer before even WSO2. We, in fact, when the web services stuff started, open source was a key vehicle to keep uh, interoperability going. Because by having software available open source, just as the standard was coming out, it made it possible for multiple people to take that and, and actually interoperate, mm -hmm. rather than saying you have a specification, which was the previous sort of IEEE way of doing things was very much, uh, uh, or, uh, was very much a, a, like write a specification, put it out, and then people would implement it over the years. This was very much put the software out along with the specification so people can build on it immediately. Um, yeah, so contributing to open source was, uh, was really our vehicle for competing as well. Uh, we believed that that was the right way to you know, take on these large corporations we were trying to take on as a, as a nobody. Yeah, great. Um, we'll come back to open source in a, in a few minutes, but I want to um, ask about the social impact that WSO2 has had. You've, got a, you've had a development center in Colombo and Sri Lanka. Um, 
I think there's certain resonances with my experience here in Australia. You know, we're all countries outside of Silicon Valley, right? And we feel like second-class citizens very often. Um, but we've seen when companies come back, and I'm thinking of people like Atlassian, for example, and they create an ecosystem around them, and it really revitalizes um, or breathes new life into the software ecosystem. Um, what's been the impact in Sri Lanka around WSO2, and how have you kind of contributed to the, to the environment there? Um, yeah, so my, uh, my personal story is I am from Sri Lanka. I, was, I lived in the US for 16 years. I did a PhD and then was working in IBM for eight years. The second half of those eight years were actually working from Sri Lanka. I came back in 2001 and I was telecommuting, basically. I had an ISDN line, uh, for those of you old enough to know what that is. Uh, 64K, you know, and good times, you get two lines connected, 112. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, 56K, rather. Uh, we, so one of the motivations to start in the company was, in fact, uh, the mindset at the time was that, yeah, there are people in that side of the world, they basically do services. They don't create ideas. They don't create new technology. Uh, that you know that was annoying me. Uh, so one of the motivations was we wanted to start the company from Sri Lanka. So it's not that we have a development center in Sri Lanka. The company originated out of Sri Lanka. We registered the company in the U.S. and in Sri Lanka at the same time because raising money at the time was very difficult if it was a Sri Lankan business. Uh, things have changed a lot now uh, in terms of you know technology coming out from that side of the world or Australia or the world has changed the mindset. Uh, but in the first uh, many times of funding attempts, people say, where the hell is Sri Lanka? And when are you coming back to US? Like, well, it's over there and I'm not coming back. So <laughs> see you later. Because that was the usual answer for that. Um, the impact wise, we've, uh, we, are, we are probably the largest, uh, uh, not probably, we are easily the largest uh, serious technology company in, in, in Sri Lanka. We employ about 1,000 people there now totally, including a variety of students and interns and so forth. The whole company is about 1,000 full-time people globally. Um, about 850 people are in Sri Lanka. And the, I would say the biggest impact is on, on individuals. I think more than 100 uh, people who worked in WS2 have left and gone to grad school and done computer science PhDs. Uh, and you know we've had massive impact. We have people all over the world um, and so in terms of the ecosystem and so on, I'm not happy with the level of influence we've had on other companies and building values up. Uh, it's very difficult to change the mindset of, well, let's just do services and be happy with it. Mm. Uh, yes. yeah. I think. That, that certainly has resonance with my experience. Um, I guess when I was doing work, in, when I started in the 90s, um, services was the only game in town, really. Yeah. I was actually a product manager on a geospatial database that we built in the 90s from CSIRO. We got research out of there. And we were trying to sell this enterprise software pre-internet, right? You had to have things like brochures and salespeople. And you had to travel And tapes to, to ship the software. In. Yeah. We, oh, um, I, I was shipping a $10,000 server on a three and a half inch floppy drive. I was a bit embarrassed by that. Um, I was pleased when we ship, shifted to CDs. It looked a little more impressive. <laughs> so, yes. Um, and I, I think uh, we're seeing the continuity now. So we've had the advent of the internet and we can sell software anywhere now. Um, we've also had, we're coming out of the pandemic and everybody has shifted to working remotely. Um, and. Yeah, we've started working remotely. There's been a diaspora of people moving out of large cities. Um, and a redistribution of talent, I think. Um, what's your view on that? Do you think that's going to stick, that we're going to have people working more and more from where they want to live rather than where they have to provide services? Yeah, um, absolutely. So we had, we had a, a main office in the US in, in, uh, in uh, Mountain View. And when the pandemic hit, obviously we had to shut it down. Nobody was coming into office. And after a while, people who were living in the Bay Area were like, well, why the heck am I paying this kind of crazy rents or crazy expenses to live here? I'll just go move somewhere else. So people literally dispersed all over the US. 
Um, same thing happened in Sri Lanka. People who were living in Colombo were struggling with traffic. Like, why am I doing this? I might as well just go live somewhere else. And that's happened significantly now. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't, I don't think people will all want to come back. I think there is a certain group of the working population, especially younger people who are still, where work life is a big part of their social life. That is a big missing segment. Uh, so we do need to address that and we need to find ways of facilitating people to come back to the office for that purpose. Not really for the purpose of needing a place to sit and work anymore. With connectivity being prevalent, with, you know, with laptop plus connectivity, that's all you need to work from somewhere. And you got it wherever now. So, but the social interaction, you know, this gathering, as, as we repeatedly said, uh, you know, virtually, um, uh, virtually versus being physical, there is a big difference. The 22nd uh, experiment we did, you know, that he had to put a stop to, right? Uh, because it's it's fun, it's much nicer, and you try that online. Uh, yes, the technology is almost there. We could put it off, but practically, it's nonsense. It doesn't it doesn't meet, right? Uh, so we we see. Uh, so we have. Uh, I kind of my mental model is we have a thousand employees, we have a thousand offices, right? Some of them might be sitting at home, some of them might be coming to a collective place where there are multiple people. But we are connected in, I'm going to use a buzzword that uh, Mark didn't use, uh, metaverse. We are connected in a, in a metaverse of sort of communication. Uh, and, and we are all part of that ecosystem somehow, uh, also dispersed in time because of people in all over the world. Yeah, yeah that, that's great. I mean, it's finding the balance. It's finding the balance between um, social connection, physical connection, and then productive time. <laughs> I think, yeah. Cool, okay, well, let's turn a bit now to technology protocols, those kinds of things. Now, as we said, you've, you've kind of been there at the beginning of the web service as well. Um, I mean, prior to that, we had the Corvo world. I kind of dimly remember that. Um, what was the Sun RPC? That was my first framework that I used. Um, so we've seen a lot of change in the integration landscape over the years, from web services through ESBs, through the death of SOA, um, I think SOA is now still very much alive, uh, the rebirth of APIs and microservices. Um, so it seems like over the years, a lot has changed, but a lot has kind of stayed the same. Um, how have you and WSO2 kind of navigated that technological change? Yeah, um, I think the, the, the concept of services uh, is fundamental to economic behavior. Um, and we just heard about algorithmic interactions. And, and those interactions are, you know, one algorithm providing another service to an algorithm providing another service, communicating with each other and, and a network of those services. So the concept of services are fundamental to how the economy works. So, so that is a fundamental concept of interaction in some sense. Uh, the technology for how you do that you know, as you said, you know, you went to uh, I also started with Sun RPC. Uh, you know, uh, then there was Coba, then IOP, then SOAP, and REST, and now we have GraphQL, gRPC. Uh, who knows what will come up next, right? And 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 absolutely something will come up next. And the the goal there is constantly make it easier and easier for developers to write this stuff, because still the actual process of implementing integrations uh, is too slow and too expensive and, and too error prone and too failure prone and all kinds of things. Uh, so for us, uh, we, when we started, it was an XML universe we started in. Uh, XML was still somewhat in its early days in 2005 and SOAP was pretty much brand new at the time. Um, but you know, I, I think many of the developers today don't really touch XML anymore. Unless you have some legacy system to talk to, you don't really do anything unless with XML. You're forced to, yes. Yeah, unless you're forced to. Yeah. Uh, now it's about JSON for the most part, um, or, or you know, protobuf or whatever the next uh, format that we want to work with. So, uh, as a company, our uh, our vision is around improving developer productivity for building awesome experiences for customers. 
Yeah, and in the end, and as you noted here, as, as uh, was noted earlier, customer is no longer just about a B2B only or B2C. Now we have algorithmic customers. You have other kinds of customers that you have to work with. Uh, so the technology for how you do that will absolutely keep on evolving. And if you're a tech company, the last thing you can do is to say, well, you know, I built this company on this kind of technology, and we're going to stick to that. And that's a dying tech company if you do that. So you have to be able to constantly think ahead and say, what do you change and what do you adopt and how do you evolve and be part of the ecosystem of defining and you know, evolving that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a daily battle. Um, and, and Web3 was mentioned, you know, Web3 has all kinds of new protocols that are of interest and, and you know, potentially uh, impactful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think um, yeah, the syntax keeps changing, but I think the semantics of recurring and recurring. Uh, and when I think back, XML was a, a big thing. I think I probably worked on the first XML project in Australia, but that, that's another story. Um, the, the evolution of XML that I saw was XML went from being a markup language to a configuration language, and then to a programming yeah. language, <laughs> and, and then it, it sort of collapsed on its own uh, um, complexity, I guess. And I'm seeing similar things rhyming now with, with YAML. Um, so we've now got these vast YAML scripts, which are configuration. They're going to become Turing complete and sentient in the next few years. Um, at, you know, running inside Kubernetes uh, deployments Absolutely. and things like that. So we keep repeating these things over and over again. Maybe we've got to forget about the syntax. <laughs> and accept that and, and get on, as you say, with the developer experience, which I think has become the key lesson out of all of those years, in my mind, is developer experience and getting developers productive as fast as possible. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the, you know, people, uh, we, we tend to find a piece of technology and, and for some reason, you know, the Gartner hype curve always comes true which is that people just you know, find the next thing that comes, the next big company that says, we're using this and we're really productive with this. There's a massive push saying, that's what everybody needs to do. And you hype it up. Then you realize, well, OK, yeah, that works for that scenario. That works for that kind of guys. It works for that kind of use case. And then it falls apart. And then finally, you find that yeah, there is some sort of a you know, kernel of great idea in there. And that becomes a plateau of productivity. Uh, so, the, uh, unfortunately, we, uh, in, in this industry, I think far from you know, physics and other areas which tend to be more slower moving, and because there's so much funding involved in this industry, nobody wants to miss anything. So in that early stage, everybody jumps on something saying, okay, let's grab this, let's grab this. Yes. And that drives up the hype. Uh, after a while, you realize it's hype, and then you come down to more reality. Um, so it's a constant challenge to know what that right thing to bet on is. Uh, and if you are on the consuming side of this technology, not on the producing side. On the producing side, uh, you know, startups are born and startups die in that curve, right? And the, the lucky startups will sell at the top. Um, it depends on your, on your purpose. If your purpose is to just create something that you can sell off to somebody else and forget about it, that works. If your purpose is to solve real problems, that doesn't work because that doesn't solve any real problem. You have to think longer term and aim for that plateau of productivity and f target that. That's what we try to do always in WC2. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that uh, I think the hype curve is totally true. Um, and it's interesting, as you point out, whether it's describing what's going on or determining what's going on. It's probably a bit of both. <laughs> it's become a mixture of both now. Exactly. Yeah. Is self-fulfilling now. Yeah. Um, let's come back to open source. So the open source business model, um, you know, WSO2 uh, was founded on open source as a way of competing, as you said. Um, but open source, open source has been amazingly successful and probably lies behind all of the enterprise, most of the enterprise software we work with is founded on open source. It's got open source at the core. Um, and software companies have either more or less uh, kind of transparency around that.
But now with, I guess, cloud services and, and everything as a service, the open source business model is facing some uh, challenges. So what, what's your take on that? Where do you think open source is going? Um, what do you think, how did people build companies out of open source in the 2020s now? Uh, it's a very good question. So open source, um, let me let me go back a little bit and explain how we started off with open source. Um, for me, open source is about freedom to innovate digitally. Uh, when I went back to Sri Lanka in 2001, there were many, uh, you know, people were promoting the Linux user group concept was very popular back in those days. Basically saying, don't use this big ugly thing from you know, Redmond used this other thing from somewhere else, right? Uh, but most of it was about consumption. If you heard Richard Stallman speak, he talks about software colonialism. Mm. Uh, this, this concept of uh, Richard Stallman, for those of you who are too young to know who he is, he's the founder of the Free Software Foundation uh, and one of the most sort of radical uh, leftist sort of uh, open source guys around. Free guy. software, he doesn't like the word open source. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the argument there is that the software and digital everything is part of every aspect of life now. And so if you are not on the production side of the equation, you're a consumption on, on the consumption side, and you're basically addicted to that now. And, and so if you don't have any opportunity to create, then you are unable to compete uh, now. Um, so on... on for me, the open source was really an opportunity for us to say, okay, we can compete with everyone in the world by making a product that is you know, as good or better than what the largest companies in the world had, and you just give it away free, and you target it, you give it to the people who need to use it and who are willing to create with it. Uh, now, of course, cloud has changed that concept because there is no source code in all. It's just a service. And, and uh, you know, we heard earlier about the lock-in aspect of that washing machine. You know, that's a, that's a cloud service running with probably using MySQL and Linux and all kinds of open source technology underneath, but 100% locked in from the phone to the washing machine to the underlying services behind that. Um, so open source is challenged without a doubt, but at the same time, open source has uh, lots of international complications. Let me just give an example. When uh, WC2 has customers in 90 plus countries now, um, <laughs> When the Ukraine-Russia war started, we, ha we got a list of countries saying, you gotta cut these off, right? Uh, now, we have no choice because we are a US company, we had to follow the rules, so we of course cut them off because we have no choice. But then uh, these you know, software, the need for integration software, or whether it is a, a API management software, or, or you know, uh, whatever the technology that you need, that doesn't go away because you're now at war with somebody else. Um, so, Open source is the only thing that can continue to give that freedom, right? So one of, the, one of the key tenets of open source licensing is that you cannot discriminate based on who is using the software or what they're using it for. Even if they're using it to kill people, you can't stop them from using it, right? That's the principles of open source. So for me, it is very, very important that software continue to live open source. And yes, it is very useful and necessary, important that it's available as a service in the cloud. But some... The, the, the core of that software must be available open source because many countries, if you're building a national strategy, if you're building Australia national infrastructure, um, you, can't, you can't just build it on cloud technology. Um, you know, if you're China, you can't build it on cloud technology. If you're India, you can't build it on cloud. When, I, when I've advised Sri Lanka, I say, absolutely not. We cannot build it on, on cloud technology only because if you annoy the right people or the wrong people, you get cut off. And then you no longer can communicate. You can't have email. You can't run your, your workflow. So what are you supposed to do when the world is digital, yeah. right? So absolutely, open source for me is about freedom of, of the ability to innovate digitally. And you can't stop it. Yeah. So that's one side of the coin. Freedom is a very important side of the coin. I guess the, the other side of the coin is the creators of open source and the incentives they have to build and share their open source. I mean, many people are um, build out of passion and share because uh, that's, that gives them a, a great deal of, um, of, of uh, 
just uh, satisfaction right, to share the, the, their creations. Uh, but then, you know, satisfaction doesn't put food on the table, etc. And so we were in the past, in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, we had good business models where people could create open source software, provide support for it, and uh, build companies out of it. Um, but my concern, I guess, is in the, in the days of the cloud now, um, there's more incentive to close things off and, and just provide an as-a-service uh, function. Um, so that, that seems to me to be a, um, a challenge to the open source model. Uh, absolutely it is, uh, uh, and you're absolutely right that in, in the 90s, uh, people who contributed to open source were people who had a day job in non-open source software companies who would voluntarily contribute in the evenings, so to speak, uh, on open source projects. And so you put up an open source project, then people would come to contribute to that because they're interested in that area. That has completely changed. Basically, there's nothing that is not open source now. And every project you put up as an open sourcing, there are five other versions of the similar idea around already. Um, so you can't really uh, anymore rely on voluntary contribution as a driving force for evolving open source technology. That era has unfortunately gone. Uh, so what we have now are essentially paid developers working on open source stuff. Um, and this happens for two reasons. One is it's a public good being done by a common group of people, CNCF is probably one of the most uh, vivid examples of that now, right? All the, all Kubernetes, all the infrastructure of the modern cloud deployment platform is fully open source and is being contributed to by all the competitors of this marketplace of that industry because it's necessary and good for everybody to have it like that. Um, then, uh, and the Apache Software Foundation is very, very active and alive yet. There are hundreds of projects there. Uh, the model has completely changed. Each project is run typically by one company or led by one company. Apache tries very hard to make it into a community model and has lots of guidelines and rules on how to build that community. But the bottom line is there are the people who are contributing are paid to be a contributor to that. And so if you change jobs, you stop contributing. Mm. Right? <clears throat> Personally, my hope is when somebody starts contributing to an open source project that you build some passion and interest in that and you will continue to contribute to that. Now, coming back to the business models, yes, so WS2 is an example of a company that all our code is open source. We've never gone to an open core model. Uh, we've given away everything, and we built a nearly $100 million business now. Right? Um, so I think the opportunity is still there. A cloud is very much uh, very, very necessary and very much a buying pattern for many uh, countries. Um, so it is, it is not easy anymore to say, I'm going to build a business that's purely based on open source, especially because if you, if you are successful as an open source thing, one of the cloud scavengers will come and take that and offer, uh, you know, and offer it as a service and kick you out of your own business. Yes. Yeah. And they may not even pay you for it. Mm. That's a problem. That is the big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the future of integration. So we've talked about, you know, WSO2 started out as a you know, web services platform or your earlier products, web services platforms. We've moved beyond web services into API management, API security, um, and the, the landscape keeps evolving. I, I'm seeing a lot of change in the API landscape right now. There's a, there's a great unbundling that's happening at the moment, which is fascinating to watch. Um, so, and I think, um, I think, you know, what, I think to a certain extent, the practice of integration is kind of disappearing and kind of also becoming more, uh, more part of everybody's day job, right? We, we no longer have an integration competency center and only those guys do integration and everyone else does real software engineering, right? Um, Integration is now becoming part of everybody's job because we're building microservices, we're building APIs, we are consuming and providing APIs, and integration ends up being a byproduct of that interaction. Um, so, how do you see the future kind of panning out for the, the integration landscape? Um, I couldn't agree with you more. The, I think integration as a thing of its own 
uh, is very much over. Uh, and it went away with many, many aspects. One is the services uh, architecture becoming predominant within the enterprise where you can't do anything without talking to a bunch of other services. So you can't write a new core business logic service without integrating to existing yeah. services. So therefore, every problem has become a problem of integration to some extent. Um, on, on the other side, the, the technology for integration um, and the technology for deployment with the advent of Kubernetes and containerization and smaller workloads being deployed, the idea of a server sitting in between has gone away. Right? We no longer have servers that are there, application server. You know, when's the last time you talked about Tomcat? Right? Five years ago, even maybe, certainly 10 years ago, Tomcat would have been the hottest word of the day. Yes. Right? And, and web application servers and this kind of server and that kind of server, we don't talk about that anymore. No. Because that serving concept is now part of the program. If you write a program in Java, you write with Spring Boot, you bring it up, the server is built into the program. right? Uh, you don't have a separate server that handles the service logic and then brings in your code to run, which was the application service job. Uh, ESBs died a similar path, right, and, and so on. So that the path that we are on is we're bringing workload into smaller units of work, and that workload itself is a service. So, it, and that service, so whatever the workload that you're running, whether it's whatever logic, is offering a service and it's consuming services. So. Is that integration or is that programming? Mm. And that's partly why we started working on this new programming language called Ballerina, yeah. which addresses exactly that problem and says, look, you, don't, you can't separate these two anymore. You need programming languages that understand the challenges of network interaction and network integration as part of the problem of writing code. It's not something different anymore. Yes. Yeah, so building that, that distributed logic into the programming language. It's that's like right, and, and that's language. kind of, uh, you know, in, in the last 20 years, one of the things uh, we've seen evolving is that the, the process of software engineering has actually become an engineering discipline instead of an art form, where we have CI, CD, we have GitOps, we have DevOps, we have a process for how to engineer software now. Yeah. And we're not always very good at it because we still have lots of bugs that show up and we have lots of uh, you know, uh, non-scalable things we end up with. But for the most part, if you look at the, the tool chain that exists for how to write software and deploy it at scale, is incredible now. And, and that tool chain is all about programming languages. It's not about servers. Uh, so, so the, uh, and then combine that with the need to deploy into tinier and tinier bits of infrastructure, which is what a container basically is, uh, means you can't have something else around, it's got to be in the code. I just write the code, and I run the code, and the code does its thing. Yeah, that's great. OK. Um, just looking at time. I think we've got, we've got time for one or two questions. If anyone from the audience has got a question they'd like to ask. So while, while we're waiting for if somebody wants to ask, um, you mentioned Ballerina. It's uh, interesting. It's an interesting language because it's got it's got a graphical notation and a and a, a, syn a syntactical notation. Um, how do you see the balance between? Do people use the graphical over the over the syntax or a mixture of the two? Or how does that? kind of work in practice, do you think? Yeah, so, so at, an, at an engineering level, engineers like to write code. They don't like to draw pictures. Yes. Um, but at the same time, when I'm trying to understand a program, a picture is worth a 1,000 words. Yeah. And the reality with enterprise application logic is you write it once and gets read 50 times, right? That's yeah. a cliche, but it's mm -hmm. really true and gets evolved hundreds of times. Uh, so the ability for the, and, and we know this concept of model-driven architecture and so forth has been around in computer science and software engineering yes. from 1960s, <laughs> never realized OMG you know, yes, was, uh, exactly. uh, was the predominant uh, promoter of that term, uh, never really practically realized because the, the concept of having a model and being able to write code by translating the model to code and then writing code doesn't work because uh, that works the first time, the first time you iterate. 
but in reality you iterate. And yeah. so when you come back, the model is out of sync. Yes. Um, so that's where the picture, the fact that the code is the picture, the picture is the code, starts mattering. Yeah. Where whatever the program that you write remains true to its rendition in a pictorial form, in, in, a, in an algorithmic conceptual form, because that is the source code. It is not something different. And to make that work, you need to adjust the level of abstraction that you have in the programming language. And programming languages are all about abstraction. Computer science is all about abstraction, fundamentally. So it's about the way you think and the way you translate that thinking into this really dumb machine that we are programming to make yeah. it do something. So to capture thinking at the right level fundamentally means capturing abstractions that you have in your head into the language and then being able to render it in a form that human beings can understand. And for us, pictures really work very well. Yeah. And that's why the language was designed so that the abstractions that you want to record graphically are represented in a first class way in the syntax. It is not a second class picture. It is the code. Mm -hmm. And just, just to come back to that, the, we tried that, I guess, a decade ago or so with XML as the language. That's, right. That's when XML became a programming language. We had these drag and drop interfaces that generated XML. But of course, when you then started to try and keep that in source code control and do diffs, um, exactly. you, you came up against the big barrier there. So um, XML was, the, I guess, the, the dead end uh, in that respect. But now with a, with a language that you can put under source code control but still render into images, that, that kind of solves that, that issue. Yeah, exactly. So DSL approaches to this problem works to a point, yeah. uh, and they're very powerful, very beautiful, until you hit the wall. Yes. When you hit the wall, there is nothing except lift the hood and go underneath. Yeah. Uh, and then you lose it all. Yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, I, I think the, so the, uh, for me, uh, we are in an era of language renaissance. We have Go, we have Rust, we have Swift, we have so many new languages that have become popular in the last, uh, last 10 years. Uh, whereas if you go back to the 90s and the 2000s, so the 90s was all about Java, then it was about JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, now, yes, Node and JavaScript still plays an important, and TypeScript more in, 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 as a better language plays a very important role. But Go plays a very important role. Rust plays a very important role. Um, Python plays an important role. So there is a, we are in an era where languages as a form of abstraction, we are no longer saying one size fits all. Uh, we, are, we are willing to say, look, for the problem that I'm trying to abstract, there are ex forms of expression that are better for this problem than other forms of expression. And it's worth having different forms of expression. And that's where Ballerina is going to try to play a role in. Absolutely. OK, great. Well, Sanjeev, it's been a pleasure to um, chat with you and to have you visit us at Happy Days Australia. Um, thanks, thank you for your time. Thank you very much.